All right, well, we're going to jump right into the Word of God. If I can find where I'm at there. There we go. Go with me to Luke chapter 4. Now, uh, also, we're going to, now, this after, after the service today, we're having a uh, church congregant, that, that's a technical word for it, uh, meeting. How many of you are Dominion Life Church members? You have filled out a paper, you've done something, you've gone online. Okay, let me see hands. Good, good. All right. And are you going to be staying over? How many of you are going to be staying over for the meeting there? Good, good, good. All right. Put those hands down. Now, is there anyone here today that wants to become a member and wants to do it now? You want to do it now? Let me see your hands real quick. All right. All right. Keep them up for just a minute. They're going to hand you a paper, and you can fill it out, and then you can stay for the meeting if you want. All right. And so, but we need those those. We need you on the roll before we let you into the meeting. That's what it comes down to. So, because it's kind of an official meeting, we're going to have some important stuff we're going to be talking about. We'll tell you about that in a bit. Um, and what else? Let's see. Uh, yeah. So if we can get those filled out very quickly, then we will take those up also here shortly. But we want you to um, right now. And I'm just going to tell you this straight out. Uh, we have about. I think they said about 200 and roughly 275 members here. I think it is about that. Yeah, uh, here local, and then we have seven or 800. Uh, I think it is online or no, about five or six. Yeah, because together it made about 800. So uh, all together, those are also online, and we have to use different terminology for the online members. Technically, we technically can't call them members. Um, so that's all. Legal stuff, it doesn't matter. We're all in this thing together, and we're advancing the gospel together. Amen? And so uh, we'll be talking about that today, as a matter of fact. So, all right, now, so all those passed out. Um, matter of fact, yeah. And uh, where's Nilsa? You got a camera? You already did it? Oh, that was quick. Wow, okay, never mind. Okay. All right, <clears throat> well, then go ahead now, turn with me to Luke chapter 4, Okay. Luke chapter 4. Now, listen, I'm, I'm going to give you a scenario, right? Let's say that you were willing, and I said, uh, let's say you came to me and said, Curry, is there something I can do to help out? And I said, yeah, actually there is. Matter of fact, I want you uh, to go around the parking lot because it's, you know, it's really trashy, trashy parking lot. We need the parking lot cleaned up. So I want you to go clean up the parking lot. Now, when you clean up the parking lot, I want you to take all of the trash and put it in the trash can number one. Then I want you to take the metal cans and put that in trash can number two. And then I want you to take anything that's recyclable, plastic, whatever it is, that you take that and you put all of that in trash can number three. Now, it, can you understand that? Okay, so you could do that. Is that right? Okay. So go get busy. It's really, it's really nasty out there. So go, go. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> now, okay, but, but isn't that simple? Now, okay, now think about this. What if in an hour somebody was driving by and they saw you, maybe they knew you, and so they whip around and come back in and say, hey, you know, oh, what, what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm cleaning up, I'm cleaning up the trash. Well, but how, how, do you, how do you know? How do you know you're supposed to do that? Well, Curry said he wanted the trash picked up, and I volunteered, so I'm picking up the trash. But, okay, so are, have you got an earpiece in? Is Curry telling you uh, which trash to pick up? Or is he just, you know, well, no, he told me, he gave me specific details. He said he wanted me to take, you know, get all the trash, and then he told me what to do, trash can number one, number two, number three, what to put in each. He told me what to do that, so that's what I'm doing. So, but you're saying, but so Curry didn't tell you to pick up that can. Well, no, because uh, he told me cans go in trash can number two. So that's, he'd already told me that, and that's a can. So I'm putting it in trash can number two. So there we go. But yeah, but how do you know he want that, that he actually wants you to pick up that can? You see where I'm going, right? See, that's how most people see what Jesus did. They think 
that God was whispering in his ear constantly, heal this one, open the eyes of that one, do this for this one. And there's nothing in the Bible that says that. Nothing like that. As a matter of fact, we're going to look at it right now. Now watch this. All right. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now watch this. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about today is God's will according to Jesus. Do you get that? And if anybody knows God's will, it would be Jesus, right? Okay. This, when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, and he began to speak. In verse 18, it says, and this is Jesus preaching in the synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because, here's why the Spirit's on me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, let's stop right there for just a second. Notice what he said. There we go. <laughs> but now notice. When he told this, here's, here's how Christians read it. I'm going to read it to you again. This is how most Christians read that. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to some of the poor. He has sent me to heal some of the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to some of the captives, and recovering of sight to some of the blind, to set at liberty some of them that are bruised. You say, well, Curry, why would people think that? I, I don't know why they would, but that's obviously by how they teach, how they live, or whatever it is. That's what they believe God told them to do, or told Jesus to do. Why? Because they think he had to t that God had to tell Jesus which ones to heal, when to heal them, do this, don't do. And so they try to take that and make it a doctrine of, well, Jesus said he only does what he sees his father do. And so that, obviously, he had to, uh, the father had to tell him exactly who to heal. Now, wait a minute. You just said two different things. First off, you said, you quoted Jesus and said he only did what he saw his father do. And you took that to mean that he didn't actually do or, you know, that he did what he saw his father do. You take that to mean uh, whatever his father told him. Do you see the difference there? And so... What Jesus did was, now think about this. Jesus stated his purpose. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, 17, going into 18, it tells us exactly what his purpose was. This is my mission. Now, what does that mean? This is the will of God. Is that right? So whatever he did was the will of God. And so he didn't walk around and go, uh, oh, no, sorry. He never had a person come and say, uh, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. Open my eyes. Mm, no, sorry. Uh, you, you're not on the list today. No. See, he didn't do that. Do you, do you understand? See, we have to understand that God put his spirit in us. God's spirit was on Jesus and in Jesus. Is that right? So how did he lead and guide him? By his spirit. Now, what does that mean? Now, see, get this. I could say, I'm going to lay hands on the sick in a few minutes. Why? Because I'm only going to do what I see my father do. And people say, oh, well, that means he's not going to lay hands on everybody, just who he sees the father lay hands on. Uh, okay, first off, Jesus said, and I'm going to give you all the scriptures on this. I'm kind of giving you, I don't want to say a summary, but I want you to, to understand the direction here. Because this is vital, vital, if you're going to live the life Jesus wants you to live. Because Jesus, remember whenever Philip said, Jesus, show us the Father, and it'll suffice. And Jesus said, Philip, if you've seen me, he said, first off, he said, man, I've been with you so long, and you, you haven't seen the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
So the disciples, including Philip, the 12, could say, well, we're only doing what we saw the Father do. What? When did they see the Father do it? When Jesus did it. Does this make sense to you? See, I want to simplify this because we've got to get past, we've got to kill every excuse that the devil will try to bring to our mind to say, well, that was, Jesus was special in that sense, and so now we have to have this thing, you know, this certain way of doing things uh, before we can do that. That's not true. We don't, we don't have to see something. How do you see Jesus? How have you ever seen Jesus? Right here. And, and the thing is, what you see and hear about him is consistent. All the way through. Why? Because he is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen? So we, we, if we see Jesus, we see the Father. And Jesus said, listen, I'm just doing what my Father does. That's what I do. Amen? Does that make sense? Listen, this is vital. You've got to get a hold of this. Because what this means is, is that you see Jesus, and over and over again it says, when he knew, when he saw the woman that was bowed over in Luke 13, he says, when he saw her, he called her to him and said, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. Then he laid his hands upon her, and immediately she was made straight. When he saw, not when he heard the father. Not when he saw the father heal her, because, listen, if he saw the father heal her, he wouldn't have had to heal her because she would have been healed by the father. See, this whole thing the enemy has built up to try to make people not do something. No matter what you preach, the enemy tries to come in and find a reason to get people not to do it. And that's where these sacred cows and all these things come up. So I just want to show, I want to give this to you. I want to show you God's will according to Jesus, right? So God's will according to Jesus has to be that the Spirit of the Lord be upon you, that he has anointed you, right? And what does he anoint you to do? Preach the gospel to the poor. <clears throat> You've been sent to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. You say, well, well that's what Jesus was sent to do, but you know, that's, that's not me, that's Jesus. Yeah, and Jesus said, as my Father sent me, so send I you. So see, you can't differentiate. Well, well, but I'm not Jesus. Then it sounds like you really need to lean heavy on him. Isn't that right? You need to lean heavy toward that and say, man, I'm relying on your strength to do this because I can't do it. So I expect you to do it because you're the same. And I'm just doing what I see the Father do through Jesus. That's what I'm doing. Is this, do you get this? <laughs> okay. Now listen, I'm not... Well, I am kind of in a way, I guess. Everything we do isn't about healing. I know a lot of people think that. But the reason healing comes up, because it's not just healing here. It's preaching the gospel. It, you know, it's helping the, the hurting, right, in every area. But it's not just about healing. But the reason it goes to healing so often is because that is the dispensation of the grace of God that's been given to me for me to get rid of these sacred cows in this area, in the area of the power of God and in the area of healing according to God's will. And so he's constantly kind of pouring that on me and makes me think of things. And I'm like, oh, hey, yeah, I hadn't thought of that that way before. And so, it, but it's constantly going back and forth. And it's not just that. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff that, I'm, that I study and different things, and it all adds to it. But there's only so much time in a service for me to bring out certain things. So I tried to distill it down to something that is very simple and direct so that you can kind of, as they would say, hang your hat on and know that you can do it. Now, that doesn't mean that I think everybody in here is going to jump up, run outside, and start finding every sick person to lay hands on them. I wish it would happen that way. Uh, but generally, it's the 80-20 rule. You know? And so I understand that. But you need to know that when the opportunity arises that you're able to do whatever is necessary. And so that because of that, I can preach to everyone the same message because one of the things that is important is that nothing I've done has been technically because of a gift. I'm not saying gifts don't function. They, they do. But especially in the areas of gifts of healings, things like that, is that 
because we operate under authority, dominion, faith. And because of that, when we get into a place where God needs to add a particular gift, he does. But if I, had, if I wasn't obeying Mark 16 in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, then the other stuff would never kick in because I wouldn't even be doing the basics. So, but the key is anybody can do what I do when it comes to healing the sick and, and just the, what, it, what it says a believer is supposed to do. And so I'm hoping that the more you hear and the more of these things that, that we keep kind of piling on to you in this, that is chasing away any of the sacred cows and hopefully it's getting rid of your excuses for not just reaching out to touch people, reaching out to bless, reaching out to help people. But to do that, we've got to go beyond our needing help ourselves. Right? We've got to go to the point where, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fighting these things off. We've won this battle. We've won that battle. And I know God is with me. And so, yeah, and now I'm not under a battle myself. And, man, I can really help other people. And then when you start doing that, a lot of times the battle comes on and, you know, we ought to be first partakers of what we preach, how we live. And so you ought to be able to pick that up and run with it. And that's my whole goal. My goal is to literally create an army of believers that everywhere they go, as they go, they heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, they preach the gospel. Why? Because freely have they received, so freely they give. We've got to take back the ground that the enemy has stolen, especially in the church when people look at it and think, well, uh, I, mean, I mean, think about this. Do you really think you're going to go to a person on the street and say, oh, you need healing? Yes, I do. Well, well you know what? If you'll send an offering to brother so-and-so, then you'll get it. You, do you think that's going to work? Do you think Jesus would have done it that way? Obviously not. He didn't. But yet we have that in our psyche now because it's so prominent in church. But you notice most of the stuff, I'm just, be blunt, listen, I'm on Christian television, but most of the stuff that's on Christian television doesn't work anywhere but in church. And, it, and honestly, a lot of it doesn't even work there. That's why they have to keep coming out with the next book, you know, That's why they have to keep coming out with different stuff, you know, how to, how to break the curse, uh, how to pray the prayer that'll break the curse, how to Pray prayers that'll keep the curses off. I mean, it's just volume one, two, and three. It just keeps on going. Why? Because volume one and two didn't work. So they got to have a volume three, right? And so, well, but, you know, the reason we're not seeing the results is because we're not praying from the courts of heaven. See, that's where we messed up. No, the reason it's not working is because you're not praying according to the Bible. Amen? You don't have to go to the courts. And listen, you're already seated in heavenly places, so you're already there. You ain't got to go there and pray back down through and all that. It's not. No, we are here as representatives. We carry the authority of Jesus Christ with us here. Amen? We don't have to go somewhere and do something. Whatever situation comes up, we are able to meet that situation right then. Why? Because everything that's been given to us has been given to us. And we have everything in us that we need to get the job done. Amen? So let's keep reading because I want to I show you I have a, a, quite a bit of scripture. We're not going to go through all of it probably today, but I'm going to get as much as I can done. So <clears throat> now we just went through Luke chapter 4, verse, predominantly verse uh, 18. And now if that's what Jesus was anointed to do, then that must have been God's will because that's what he did. Is that right? He only did the Father's will. So let's look at that. In John chapter 12, verse 49, it says, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And notice he, he isn't saying uh, God is telling me what to speak. He gave me a commandment of what I should speak. Right? So that was before he left heaven. Okay. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Notice the tenses. What the Father has said, that's what I speak. Okay, now, let's look at that. Uh, that first word, said, okay, it's a, now, this is just technical for the people that want to, 
catch me in my words. I'm going to make sure I say them specifically. Okay? Uh, that word said is a verb. It's in the third person. It's singular. According to the Greek, it's in the perfect, and it is active and indicative. Now, this is how you have to go through and look at each word to figure out what they're saying, which all that means this. It is something said in the past that is still in effect. Now, what that means is that, now get this, he did not say God is speaking to me every day. He said what God said, he told me, he gave me a commandment, and I am still doing that commandment because that commandment is still in effect. What command did he give him? What he quoted in Luke chapter 4, actually he was quoting from Isaiah 61. That was what he was commanded to say. Now watch this. Uh, the second one, because now notice, what the Father said, past tense, unto me, so I speak, present tense. Okay? Notice, he did not say, what the Father is saying, that'd be present tense. He said, what the Father said. Now, the second one, so I speak, that word is a verb. It's in the first person, singular, present, active, indicative. Now, what that means is this. He would be saying it this way. I am now speaking what was said to me in the past that is still in effect. That's what that word means. That, that, I mean, it's amazing. That one word meant all of that. I am speaking now what he said in the past because that what he said in the past is still in effect. Now, that's how you and I are supposed to see the word of God. We should see it as something that was spoken in the past, but it is still in effect and we now are to say what was said now and to do what we were commanded to do, right? Now, in John chapter 12, verse 44, we're back up a little bit. The literal Greek says it this way, The word which I spoke that will judge him on the last day, because as for myself, not from myself as a source did I speak. But he who sent me, the Father himself, has given me a commandment. Now, this is what we're picking up. Given me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know with a positive knowledge that his commandment is life eternal. Therefore, the things which I am speaking, just as the Father has, spo has past tense again, spoken to me in the past, and those words are still presently in effect, thus do I now and continually speak. Now, that's, that has a lot more weight than just the King James. But that's, if you were a Greek-speaking person from the first century, that's what you would have understood that sentence to say. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. Remember, what are we talking about? The will of God according to Jesus, right? Not according to Springfield or Rome. You hear that? Not even according to Tulsa but according to Jesus himself. Verse 27, And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you, but only if it's God's will. He didn't say that, did he? And remember, whatever is not of faith is sin. So if Jesus did something that wasn't done of faith, then he would have sinned. Does that make sense? So if he did something that was not of faith, now understand, faith is based on the word of God. Okay? You can't just have faith beyond your knowledge of what the word of God says. When you find out what the word of God says, you can have faith that God will keep his word and therefore you can act on it and you can speak it and it will come to pass because you have faith in God's word. That's what faith is. So if you don't have that faith of what has been said then and you're doing something, then it's sin. Is this making sense to you? Now I know it's kind of involved here. But that's why I'm taking a while to break it apart because listen, most of you probably aren't going through DBI. Some of you probably are, but most of you probably are not. So I'm having to take the things that you would learn in DBI and present them to you here and now in a very short period of time, right? 
And so that's why I'm emphasizing this. So now we would also have to say that Jesus did it, so it must have been God's will. So it must have been God's will for Jesus to say, according to your faith, in other words, what you've said, what you've believed, I'm I'm doing what you've asked, so therefore this will happen. So it was on both of them to be obedient, you might say. Now, verse 30, and and now watch. And one of the men's eyes were opened, but it wasn't God's will for the other man. That ain't what it says, is it? Hmm. It says, and their eyes were opened. And Jesus straightly charged them, saying, see that no man know it. Now, maybe, but, you know, let's be honest, this could be a fluke. One time, Jesus laid hands on both of them, they both got healed. Okay, all right. But let's look at Matthew chapter 20. Verse 30 says, And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still, and now watch this, and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? Notice he did not say, Father, what will ye that I shall do unto them? Is that right? He said, What will ye? So God's will had to be that Jesus would do whatever they ask him to do. Do you see how, how man, how, how stretched out this gets real quick? Because he didn't say, well, let's pray and see what the Father wants to do. He said, what do you want me to do for you? Why, Why did Jesus say this? Because Jesus said that God's will is that you do for others, isn't that right, what you would want done for you. And so now, notice, this is what he would want done for him. He would want the, pow- the person with power walking up to him and saying, what do you want me to do for you? Now, you would imagine these are two blind men. He, they, he could probably tell they were blind. But he still asked them, what do you want me to do for you? Why? Because the obvious isn't always the answer. Now watch, he said, what will ye that I shall do unto you? So Jesus said it. So it must have been God's will that Jesus did whatever they wanted him to do. Then they say to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Notice it doesn't say their eyes were healed. It says their eyes received sight. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Then said I, now he's quoting, okay, Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Then, now drop down to verse 9, and he says it again. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Now, so notice what Jesus, because it's talking about Jesus, what did he come to do? The will of God. John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, last part there. Well, the first part says, He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So what does that mean? That means that God's will is to destroy the works of the devil. Because that's what Jesus did. Is that right? And he only did his Father's will. In John chapter 8, verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man... Then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. When he said, I do nothing of myself, he didn't say that he didn't have the right or authority to do as he pleased. He said, he he was literally saying here, I'm not doing this out of myself or of my own power. In other words, he was saying, the Father in me, he does the works. He was not saying that he didn't have the ability to choose to do it. Jesus had to have the ability to choose or he was not obedient and he was a robot and therefore he couldn't sin because he couldn't, if you had to be obedient, you can't sin. So therefore that undoes everything he said about himself and what he came to do for us. Amen? Excuse me. Then he says, then you will know 
when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father hath, past tense, taught me. Hmm. As the Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. He's with him. That's how he's doing the works. But notice what he said. The one that, here he says, I don't do anything of myself, but as my Father hath taught me. So he was taught to do what he did. And he said, what the Father taught me, that's what I'm saying. And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. Why? For I do always those things that please him. Which means what? Everything he did was in faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Do you you get that? Okay. Now, Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture, but I'm I'm laying this out for you. And if you need the notes or, you know, you can jot down the scriptures, whatever, go back in, get a hold of the recording. Listen, the the way, uh, one of the testimonies we heard today was a lady that said she got a hold of this and she listened to this thing and that thing and that thing and the, you know, the new man, the mind renewal, the, I mean, I mean just, what was she doing? Total immersion. That's the way to get the truth in you to where it becomes part of you. Now, I don't know about you, and I, I've walked with God for some time, but at the same time, there was a time when I wasn't walking with him. And those were years that were wasted. So for me to make up for that, I had to totally immerse so that I could make up for the time that I wasted. Now, I don't know about you, and I'm not accusing you of wasting time, but if you did, you might want to consider total immersion to get up to speed to where you ought to be. Does that make sense? And believe me, it won't hurt you. All right? It's the one thing you can't overdose on. <clears throat> so, he says there in verse 16, when the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. Now, many doesn't mean some, and it doesn't mean, you know, out of the group. <clears throat> well, he brought us many, but there's many more left. He didn't, that isn't what it means. They were just giving not a number, but letting us know there was a lot of people that they brought to him that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Why? Why? that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness. And what does that mean? That means that for Isaiah 53 to be fulfilled, everybody had to be healed. Why? Because Isaiah 53 was about the suffering Messiah that was going to take away our sicknesses and diseases. And because that was meant for everyone, then every person there had to be healed so that that could be fulfilled. So healing is for you. Amen? And it's not just for you. It's for you and everybody else that's sick. Because he didn't take some. He took all. Amen? Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Which means what? The healing of every sickness and every disease that the people had was God's will. The healing. You get that? Which means what? Not one person there was sick because sickness was God's will for them. See, it can't be God's will for somebody to be sick and it be God's will for them to be healed. God's not schizophrenic. Amen? Now, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of information here. Any one of these, you can beat the devil with. But all of it together, he might just want to run and hide. Because when you get a hold of this, everything changes. Now think about it. Look how many scriptures we've already went over. What do you think the odds are that there would be this many scriptures dealing with this, and yet it still not be God's will for everybody? The odds would have to be astronomical. So he says here... <clears throat> Verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Now that's a reference, of course, back to uh, Ezekiel. And they refer to it also in Jeremiah where he talks about the shepherds that sheared the flocks but didn't feed them. 
there were some shepherds in Israel. They were called Pharisees. They were called the rulers of the synagogue. They were the ones supposed to be taking care of these people. But he saw them and he said, now these are sheep that don't have a shepherd. They don't have a pastor. Why? Because the Bible says God told the pastors, I'm against you. Why? Because you have sheared the sheep, but you've not healed them. Go look it up. It says you have not healed them. You've not fed them. And it said, but you get fat off of them. And he said, and I'm against you shepherds that live that way. Now, God hadn't changed. You know, we have to realize there are a lot of people out there that are, she that are sheep without shepherds. Some of them, many of them, are in church. But they still don't have a shepherd. They have a hireling, but not a shepherd. So, he says... <clears throat> Verse 37, then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth, cast out laborers into his harvest. Notice that Jesus told them, number one, to pray for more laborers. More laborers to do what? More laborers must be God's will first off. Then he told them what to do. So he, he said, pray for more laborers. And then he told his disciples what to do, and they were laborers. And he said, pray for more laborers just like you that will do the same stuff I'm telling you to do. And when, in chapter 10, verse 1, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power, authority, against unclean spirits. To do what with them? To cast them out. And to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Why? Why? He was sending them to do exactly what he was sent to do. He told them exactly in, uh, well, yeah, in Luke, what we just read, for, for example, Luke 4, and then also from, of course, Isaiah 61. But in Luke 4, he said, this is what I'm sent to do. But in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, this is what I'm sent to do. So those aren't two different jobs. When he's sent to do, to heal, to set free, to set the captives free, to heal the brokenhearted, that is destroying the works of the devil. Just 1 John 3.8 is just a summary. Just like Acts 10.38 is a summary. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. <clears throat> then it says, in verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles, unless it's God's will. <clears throat> Isn't that strange? He didn't, he didn't say unless it's God's will. He knew it wasn't God's will at that point. Why? Because they had to go first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And into any, any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What was he saying? I'm going after the one out of the 99. I'm going after the lost sheep, right? He says here in verse 7, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Do you get that? He, he didn't say, uh, go and heal some. Go and cleanse some. Pray and fast first. To make sure you know which ones to heal. Which See, we've added all this stuff. And I know many of you already know what I'm saying and you agree with it. But it is not grievous for me to bring it to you again and bring your remembrance back to this because these things have to be reestablished and reestablished and reestablished. Why? Because we've gone so far the other way for so long that you've got to have it nailed and nailed and nailed constantly into it. This is called immersion. People, say, people ask me, how come you get the results you do? You know why? Because this is what I do. I constantly reinforce, constantly reinforce. This is where I live. I don't want to live in anything else. I want to live where all I see is Jesus healing the sick. I want to live where all I see is him feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and taking care of the widow. And the That's where I want to live. Amen? So I can't look at every news feed that comes out. I can't watch every program that comes out. Oh, you've got to hear this new prophecy. I don't care about a new prophecy. I have commands that I'm trying to live out. Amen? 
And, and whatever, if God needs to me to know, he can tell me. Amen? But we, to do that, see, I had a person write me just, I think it was yesterday. And they said, uh, I'm going through these things, going through this stuff. Uh, please tell me, what is the fastest, most efficient way uh, to get past this and pray for me that my mind will be renewed? Okay, first off, mind renewal doesn't happen because somebody prays for you. And guess what? Faith doesn't come because you pray for it. That's not how it comes. It comes by the word of God. You have to get into the word, and you have to get the word into you. And that's a 24-7 process. I mean, the more you can do it, the better. And every second you spend watching anything that disagrees with the word of God, you are unrenewing your mind, and you're undoing whatever we're doing in here and whatever you've been doing in your own study time. You, I'm telling you, most of the stuff you just need to turn off and get in the Word of God. I'm telling you, because I, I had this, you know, where other input, and I started realizing, and it wasn't on purpose, it was just normal stuff, normal stuff people hear on a regular basis. And then I realized, you know what, because my mind would go to it, I'm like, oh yeah, I heard this, or I heard that, I had this. and I'm like, no, no, I don't want to go there. And so I just started cutting everything off and started stripping away little by little, whatever, whatever popped up and goes, hey, oh, listen to this. Nope, mm, nope. And you can ask my wife, this is, this is all I do. I have CDs playing, some of my own, you know, a couple other people, not a whole lot. But I'll listen to that. Most of the time I spend with worship music. Most of it, when I'm driving, mostly worship music. And then I'm, you know, talking to God, meditating on the word. I can tell you right now, it's a good life, okay? Why? Because I wake up every morning, and when I wake up, I'm still singing worship. Why? Because I've been singing it all night in my sleep. I'm telling, and then God brings things, and I go to bed thinking about something, and I wake up, <clears throat> and I have the answer to it. Why? Because it comes out of my spirit while I'm asleep. My spirit doesn't sleep. And my spirit, see, you have to worship God, listen, in truth and in spirit. So your spirit doesn't sleep. So you can worship God all night long. I know this may sound strange, but I'm telling you, I wake up every morning with a song in my mouth and, and singing this stuff out. And, and it's good. And I live in this and I'm constantly, why? Because I want full immersion. I want people to say, hey, have you heard? And I say, no, mm -mm. hadn't heard that. Why? Because I don't live there. I live here. I don't want to know that stuff. Now, obviously, there's stuff I guess you got to know. I guess. I don't know. But for me, I just I want to be totally consumed with the Word of God, and I want to be <laughs> lost in the Word. I just want to be in there. This is how I think. This is how I speak. This is what goes on. And just this is life. And you say, well, that's good for you, Curry. I mean, you know, you're in the ministry. You get to do that. And, but I, I work a job. Listen, your job doesn't require your spirit. Your job only requires your mind, you know, and maybe your body while you're there. But it, it doesn't require your spirit. You, should, you can worship God in spirit all day long. It's just like they take something, you know, you turn on a radio and it's in the background. The spirit of God can be in your spirit. Worshiping God, thinking about God while you're doing stuff. And amazingly, whatever job you're doing, you'll do it better. Why? Because you access the mind of Christ. You let him come into your life. That's what happens when you immerse in the word. And it's funny because somebody will say something and you'll give them an answer you don't even think about. And it'll be the wisdom of God. Now, if you took time to think about it, you'd probably answer out of your own head. But if you just let your spirit answer, it'll come straight out, and, it'll be, and they'll go, wow, that's good. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Or they'll be on the other end. <laughs> I can't do that. <clears throat> you know, people ask me all the time, you know, man, I'm in this problem. I got this way. You know, what should I do? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know. They're going to repossess my car. They're going to, you know, we, we can't pay our mortgage. What should I do? Give. And they look at me like, well, that's a preacher's answer. <laughs> I didn't say give to me. But you, you got to, if you need, you, you give, and God will make it come to pass. I'm telling you, that's, that's the way it works. 
You know, I'm not tell, I don't tell, I never tell anybody give and then I say give to me. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about find somebody that needs it. Find, and it doesn't always have to be a church. It can be people on the street. It can be organizations and things like that that you know. I asked God about something last night and he told me what to do. And I'm like, okay. And the thing was, it didn't surprise me. And you know what else? It didn't scare me. Now, that might not mean much to you, but if I gave you the numbers, it might scare you. Okay? Why? Because I trust him. He has proven himself faithful. And so, anyway, i got to keep going here. So he says, freely you've received, freely give. He didn't say pick and choose, right? Jesus sent out laborers to heal the sick, cast out devils, and raise the dead. That must be God's will. Listen, Jesus told his disciples, go do this. He, listen, he did not give them any qualifications. He didn't, meaning, he didn't say, uh, go out and heal the sick that deserve it. Go out and heal the sick that ask you. Go out and heal the sick that have enough faith. He didn't say any of that stuff. He just said, go heal. Why? I give you power. Listen, what do you need power for? If they have to have faith. You see, if they have faith, they can get it for themselves. You don't need power. But if he gave you power, then you have faith for them. And the faith, and listen, people, well, I just don't know if I have that kind of faith. You're talking about God. How can you not have faith in God? He is the most predictable, the most faithful person you'll ever, ever come into contact with. And you say, well, I just don't know if, if I've got that kind of faith. That kind of faith ain't about you. Your faith is in him. See, I do not have faith in healing. I have faith in a God that heals. So my faith is not in healing, because if you have faith in healing, if somebody doesn't get healed, your faith is gone. But if you have faith in God that heals, people get healed. Amen? So our faith is in God. That's, but you can't have faith beyond what you know about God. That's why he says he wants us, what? To have the eyes of our understanding. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 through 23, he says that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened, right? That we might be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Not revelation in things to come. Not revelation in, well, what, is, what does the book of Revelation mean? No, revelation in the knowledge of him. Why? Because the more knowledge of him you get and the more revelation that you have of that knowledge, the more faith you have in him. Because your faith will rise to the level of your knowledge. And that, that word revealed there, it's, a, it's where we get the word apocalypse, believe it or not. Uh, apolupto, apolupto, I think, apocalypto, that's it. And it just, it simply means to take away the veil. Now, so revelation is simply how God starts to move like a, like a curtain. You know, you pull the string and the curtain starts to rise. And, and when it, you ever seen these, the best illustration we have now is really not curtains anyway, because a lot of people don't have those kind of curtains. But if you see these uh, television programs where they redo a house and then they give it to somebody and they always have the big thing in front and they're ready for the reveal, that's what it is. They go, are you ready? Yep. And then they part that thing. And you ever see, sometimes they go pretty quick, but sometimes they go slow. You ever notice that? Why? Because sometimes revelation is quick. Other times it's a little slower and you see this much. Then, you, ooh, ooh, oh, okay, now, see. Why? Because you're getting greater and greater revelation. Greater and greater revealing. Do you get that? And the more that's revealed of the knowledge of God, the more you know about him, and the more you know about him, the more faith you have. I mean, don't think about your faith. Think about who you have faith in. See it from his eyes, not your eyes. Amen? And you see what he does, and you're like, wow, that's amazing. Now, in John... Chapter 6, verse 38. Jesus said, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. That means from day one to the day he was resurrected and taken away. He did the will of God. 
Everything he did was the will of God. Jesus is our example. Whatever he did that we do is the will of God. Do you understand that? You cannot do what Jesus did and it not be the will of God. Does that make sense to you? See, what I mean by that is very simple. Whatever he did, you do it, and it's the will of God. You, you cannot, God doesn't have a different will for you than he had for Jesus. Do you understand that? See, we've got this individual thing. Well, you know, I've got to find God's specific will for me. Uh, his specific will for you is to be like Jesus, to live his life. That's what it is. Why? Because his whole, everything God is doing in you, he is conforming you to the image of his son. Now, how can he conform you to the image of his son if you can't imitate his son? And what do you mean, imitate? Doing what he did. So doing what he did is you imitating his son, which is conforming you to the son's image. Listen, you cannot be conformed to the image of God's son and not heal the sick. You can't be conformed to the image of his son and not feed the hungry. Amen? Amen? You, you, you have to do those things. Now, listen, people say, well, well, you're just talking about works. Yep, sure am. Why? Because Jesus said, the works I do shall he do also. Isn't that right? Now, I'm not talking about salvation by works. Yeah, I'm talking to people that I hope are saved. If you're not saved, get saved so you can do this stuff. Because it's fun. Doing the will of God is fun. Walking in faith is fun. You know, sometimes it's fun like a roller coaster. You know, it's like, oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. Ah! You know, the other side, you know. And it's, you know, and then they get the picture of you. You ever seen that? And you're going down, you know, and your hair's back and your, your jaws are flapping, you know, and you're going down and, you're, and you got that look of terror on your face. And as soon as you get to the bottom, you're like, let's go again. Let's go again. Yeah, that's faith. That's faith right there. That's how faith is. Oh, yeah, right there. Bless God, yep. I can heal the sick. I can cast out devils. Hey, somebody just dropped dead. <gasps> Here we go. Hey, okay, we jump on them. There we go. Why? Because that's faith. Amen? But then all of a sudden, when you've been there a few times, then it gets fun. Then you want to take other people on the ride with you because you know what's coming. And you look at them, and you get to watch them look stupid, right? And that's fun then, because you're like, here we go, here we go, here we go. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah, here we go. And then on the other side, you know, you raise your hand, you're just laughing at them. And they're, and, they're, and they're grabbing you, hanging on to you, and you're just laughing, right? Why? Because you've been on this ride before. And then the next time somebody says, oh, somebody dropped dead over here on aisle three. Let's get to work. Let's go. Let's go. It's an opportunity. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. Amen? Watch this. Let's go watch God get glorified. Let's go, let's go participate. Amen? But you've got to look at it from that point of view, not from the point of view, praise the dead. I don't you. Maybe it's, this is for you. This is God's will for you. Yeah. No, it's, it's for everybody. You know? It's, like I said, everybody wants the, uh, everybody wants the full, you know, full-time employee benefits or sometimes part-time employee work. All right, let's keep looking. John chapter 14, almost done here. John chapter 14, verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet have you not known me, Philip? I mean, think about it. He wasn't being nice. I mean, we read this in King James. See, you read King James, and King James can make anything sound nice, Right? Behold, I shall strike thee in thy head and killest thee. <laughs> oh, that's so pretty. That's so pretty. No, he's talking about smashing somebody's head. Right? But King James makes it all nice. And here we read this with Jesus. Have you not known me, Philip? Have I been so long time with you? That isn't how he said it. Because you know he got on to them several times because they didn't have faith. He said, where's your faith? He said, you perverse generation. How long do I have to put up with you? That's what he told him. He's asleep in the boat, been preaching three days, basically, and is in the back of a boat, finally, getting some sleep after all the press and all the people constantly coming up. And 
All of a sudden, a storm comes up, and now he's rocking back there, and it's good. He's asleep. And his disciples walk back. Now, can you imagine being in a, I'm not going to say a dead sleep, because that wouldn't fit Jesus, but <laughs> can you imagine being in a deep sleep? And you're back there just re- probably dreaming heaven, angels, things he's seen. Can you imagine what dreams Jesus would have had? Never thought about that before. That's something. Anyway, <laughs> anyway okay. But can you imagine what that would be like? And he's back there in the middle of a Jesus dream, which you know is going to be amazing. You know Jesus didn't have nightmares. You know, for Jesus, you know, some people have nightmares. The devil's chasing them, and they're running. With Jesus, it'd be the opposite. And it wouldn't be a nightmare. It'd be a fun dream. I get to chase devils, even in my dream. That's probably the kind of stuff he would dream about, amen? I don't know. And neither do you, so you can't say either way. So anyway, okay? But... But you have to realize what he did, right? And he's back there asleep. And then, I mean, come on, he's in a complete deep sleep. And his disciples walk back there and go, Jesus! What? Don't you care? We're going to die out here. We're dying and you're back there sleeping. And he gets up and they're like, okay, now Jesus is going to do something. And he walks up there and says, peace be still. Where's your faith? Why didn't you do it? You just saw all this stuff happen. You should have said this. You should have got up and... I didn't say get to the middle of the lake and drown. I said, let us go to the other side. So anything that popped up, you should have dealt with. Now, deal with it. You think you can handle a calm sea? Will I go back to sleep? (laughs) It doesn't say he preached to him the rest of the night. So he probably went back and went back to sleep. And they all sat there, probably just sat there. No, if it's calm, no wind, probably just sitting there in the middle of the lake, thinking about how Jesus just jumped on them. Yeah. Wow. You know, he, he ain't what everybody thinks he is. <laughs> He's all, oh, let the little children come to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll just try not walking in faith and see how he treats you. Just saying. Because he changes not. (laughs) Amen? Have you ever had Jesus say, where's your faith in the middle of something? I have. Something I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh, and then you get the idea, well, we could make it work that we could do, we could, and he's like, where's your faith? I didn't tell you to do this. I said, I'll do it. All you got to do is believe. And I'm like, okay, I'm trying to believe. You don't try to believe, (laughs) right? And I'm like, okay, I'm believing, I'm believing, and I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing, I believe, I believe. <laughs> and then you hear Jesus. Believing is not nervous. There's no nervous in arrest. Faith is arrest. Believing, I believe. Okay. Maybe he won't see my. Yeah. No, he wants you to have faith. Amen? So he says. But I came to do the will of him. Then Philip, obviously, you know, Jesus says, he that has seen, now watch this. Have you not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? And let me tell you, you ought to read this in different tones. You've been with me this long and you still, and yet you say, show us the Father. What do you think I've been showing you? What do you think you've been seeing? Where have you been? Were you not paying attention? See, we have this idea that all these, the disciples are so perfect and everything's good. Man, they were a messed up bunch. And Jesus still worked with them. He said, believest thou not that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. Notice it doesn't say he does the words. It says he does the works. Believe me. Notice he connected word and works together. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Did you know that was right after Philip? Saying, show us the Father? See, we don't always, we, we pull these things out. We don't always realize where they were at. Philip had just said, show us the Father. And he said, Are you kidding me? I've been showing you the Father. The stuff I'm doing, you're supposed to be doing. You're going to do it. 
He said, and whatever you ask in my name. Well, he said, greater works than he shall you do because I go to my father. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the father may be glorified in the son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Notice he said over and over again. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 12, verse 47. Then one, of, one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother, my brethren, this is my family. He didn't even claim his own family. We're talking about Mary. He didn't even, now I'm not saying he dishonored her, but I'm saying, he said, no, those that do the will. His brethren stood outside. They weren't with him. They didn't believe him. They thought he was crazy. They thought he was, you know, had gone too far. And his mother was standing out there with him. And he said, that's not my family. You guys are my family. Why? Because you're doing the will of God. See, we gotta, we got to realize it's doing his will is what counts. He says, and whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. John 4, 34 says, Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. John 5, 26 for as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, watch this, and hath given him authority to execute judgment. What judgment is that? Every time he laid hands on a sick, he was executing judgment in favor of the sick person and setting them free. He said the Father gave him authority in himself to execute that judgment. Jesus did not have to be told who to set free. He had the authority. He had been given the authority when he came to earth to execute judgment. He had the right to pick, to go and do, heal whoever he wanted to. And apparently, he always wanted to heal them all, which was the will of his father. And he said, he did this because he is the son of man. Notice he didn't say because he was the son of God. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good. Now listen to this, unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. John 5, 27 which we'll continue on, and hath noticed what he says, and hath given him authority to execute judgment. That's a major point. Finally, Psalm 103, well, almost finally. Psalm 103, I'm not going to lie to you. It's a couple more. <clears throat> Psalm 103, verse 6, the Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Ephesians 5, 17. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. 1 John 2, 17. The world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. John 8, 28. Then said Jesus, remember I've already read this once. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. Whatever Jesus spoke, He got from the Father, not right in that second. And He that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. As He spoke these words, many believed on Him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And beloved, right now, I've, I've taken some time here, but I will tell you what, I have told you the truth about the will of God according to Jesus. His will was that he healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out devils. Wherever he went, 
If you got in Jesus' path and you had a need, it got met. And anybody that gets in your path, their need will get met if your faith is in God. Now, listen, don't have faith in your faith. Your faith can fail you. Have faith in God. God will never fail. Amen? Amen. Did y'all get anything out of this today? Yeah. Amen. Well, well, we are going to minister. Uh, now, we're going to go ahead and receive those uh, papers. If you got, did y'all get those finished, filled out? Okay, good. If you will, we're going to receive those. We can take those up real quick. So pass those maybe to the end. Maybe let's put them, uh, I guess, on the inside. Bring them in. Yeah, bring them to this center aisle. We'll take those up. Now, if you need to leave, you are free to leave, of course, and we're going to minister to those needing help, and then we will, uh, we're going to worship as we would normally would, but then we're also going to have our uh, meeting, and we're going to talk about some stuff, and some, it's exciting stuff. I've, I've got some good stuff to bring today, amen? Um, it's, I'm excited about it, and so we're looking forward to sharing some of this stuff with you. So, um, we got them all passed in, everybody got all the papers? Keep them passing in. Pass them in. Go that way. There we go. I think they're all in the center. All right. Now, I don't know if y'all noticed or not, but I got a new pulpit. Now, this is, uh, amen, it's, it's temporary. I mean, the, well, part of it is, this part is temporary. We're going to build a more permanent thing on it. But uh, we also, and it moves. It'll go up and down. So I can use it when I'm standing or when we're recording television. We did uh, television here Friday and recorded six broadcasts. And so we can also lower it and I can put a chair behind it and it's a desk. And so we can use it for either one. So, but I like it because it gives me lots of room so I can bring lots of stuff out here and, uh, you know, books and things, especially like on Monday nights, we go through a lot of sometimes different books and different things to help. Uh, so I'm excited about it. Um, it'll be good. And it doesn't look too churchy. We're going to, uh, I, don't, I don't like that when people come in and get a mindset of church, you know, as to the degree of religion and churchianity. We're, we're not trying to do that. Uh, we want, honestly, we want you to have a mindset of heaven and what heaven's like. Amen? So, now, so we got them all passed in, got them together. Okay. So, uh, we're, let's go ahead and organize uh, the healing line, and we will minister to you. And I'm going to put my stuff up, and I'll be right back out to minister to you. So, like I said, if you need to leave, you're free to leave. Um, I do, well, we're still getting out pretty early, so we're, I mean, at least on my part, okay? <laughs> so, 